The founders of Galt's Gulch Chili, also known as GGC, wanted to create a libertarian utopia free from regulation. Their ideals are heavy on individual rights, or as many have called it, selfishness. But what happens when one founder takes selfishness too far, neglecting and harming all others? The lead developer of this project, Kenneth Dale Johnson, has been accused of running a Ponzi scheme by his fellow founders. After cutting his partners and investors out of the deal, Johnson illegally sold Chilean land to investors. It brought in over $10 million, while Johnson himself invested nothing. This resulted in lawsuits, Johnson hiring thugs to strong arm investors, and you can't make this part up, Johnson hiding in the bushes when things were looking bad for him. Years later, this case isn't fully resolved, but one of the founders, Coben, has proven how dangerous he can be after opening fire and driving into a crowd of Chilean protesters. Hello everyone and welcome to a new prism of the past. Before we get into today's episode, I wanna start by making a massive disclaimer here. Much of the gritty detail of this case comes from those who were directly involved as opposed to news sources. GGC Recovery, a website set up by those that were scammed, a blog by libertarian author who has followed the case closely, translated court documents, All of these things were used to piece together this complicated tangled web. This situation is so murky that I want to make it clear that many of the accusations in this episode are alleged. With that being said, let's take a look at what Galt's Gulch was and why it failed so spectacularly. First, let's talk about where the term and philosophy of Galt's Gulch and where it comes from. In the best-selling 1957 novel, Atlas Shrugged by Ayn Rand, the character John Galt leads industrialists and inventors to the Western wilds to form a completely transaction-based community. This revolt brings down the world economy, promoting the idea of self-reliance, freedom from tyranny, and individualism. The core of Rand's philosophies, as illustrated in her works like The Virtue of Selfishness, is that selfishness is good and altruism is harmful. Whether or not you agree with this mindset, there's no doubt that it's been widely influential for decades. Modern celebrities, politicians, and even companies like Sears have adopted her philosophies and stood by them. Although anthropologists have studied humans forming communities and looking out for one another for ages, Rand has argued that this is a learned behavior, not a natural one. According to a 2010 post from Atlas Society, named after Atlas Shrugged, objectivism states that there is no greater moral goal than achieving one's happiness. These ideals are well known among libertarians today. While libertarianism and objectivism aren't the same thing, Rand herself preferred the label radical for capitalism than libertarian. There is some overlap. For now, all that matters is that many of the people in this episode support the idea of a focus on personal happiness and freedom from regulation. So where does that feed into a real world Galt's Gulch? Well, a group of libertarians decided they wanted to build this unregulated and capitalistic society for themselves. Members of this group like Ken Johnson, Jeff Berwick, John Coben, and John's associate, German Ezeguire. Jeff Berwick reached audiences through his newsletter and video podcast, The Dollar Vigilante, while Coben hosted Red Hot Chili, a radio program. On it, he extols the country's low taxes, rigid anti-abortion laws, and traditional gender roles, according to Mother Jones. Coben also ran for Congress in South Carolina in 2006 for the Libertarian Party, but was arrested for domestic violence just days before the vote. The charges against him were later dropped. All four of them believed that Chile would be part of the perfect location for a real world Gals Gulch and created a business plan on September 8th, 2012 to create exactly that. As outlined in the plan, they didn't want to fight the system any longer and intended to acquire multiple properties with a total of almost 20 square miles. In the central property, they wanted a concrete house with a small orchard that had oranges, lemons, avocados, and almonds, as well as a natural spring. Land for farming and mining coal was also part of their plan to become self-sustainable. According to libertarian writer, Terence McGilseppe, who had posted extensively on the topic of GGC, Coben and his associate had already tried to purchase land known as the Freedom Orchard, but they weren't able to raise money for it. 
they were able to find attractive land known as El Peñon nearby and decided to split the shares of the holding company accordingly. The details of it don't particularly matter, but what you need to know is that Coben and his assistant were going to receive 30% of the shares of the holding company while Berwick and Johnson split the remaining 70. Also in late 2012, GGC did raise money from their very first core round of investors who they refer to as the founding fathers. In early advertising documents to the specific group, they outlined their plans for GGC, praised the men behind it and offered up these shares for half a million dollars each. They came with the promise of a 2% lifetime share of all annual income from the sale of electricity, water, organic food, and fish at Galt's Gulch, with projections landing at around $60,000 per year. However, even in the early stages, Johnson seemed to push Coben out of the deal. By registering the land to Immobiliaria Galt's Gulch SA, or IGG, a Chilean entity that he and Berwick controlled. One timeline of events states that this happened before the ink had even dried on the GGC papers, about a month after the sale. If this wasn't bad enough, the land wasn't even viable in the first place. What's important to understand is that in Chile, purchasing surface land and water rights are two entirely separate processes. Johnson had surface only water rights, but that gave him very little water, definitely not enough to sustain an entire community. The few wells that they did have, he didn't register in time, and the land they intended to develop could only be divided into 12 parcels, a far cry from the 3,000 that Johnson had promised. Basically, the entire process was a comedy of errors from the beginning. Johnson's claimed that Corbin and his assistant misrepresented the land, even attempting to sue Coben over this in March, 2013, and spending over $100,000 of investor funds on legal fees. GGC Recovery argues that Johnson didn't perform his required due diligence before purchasing the land, and three law firms told him as much. Either way, Ken Johnson was in a bind. He even tried asking neighbors if they would commit their own properties to the development, promising they would retain ownership and receive a cut of the profits, all while looking for another piece of land. In April, 2013, Johnson finally met someone who could supposedly get him out of this dire situation, seller Guillermo Ramirez. According to Coben, his partner German had just agreed to buy a piece of land called Lepe for $3 million. Lepe had a 100 hectare neglected lemon orchard and a mostly dead avocado orchard. 12 buildings on the site were in need of renovation. Some were teardowns. Yet before he could seal the deal, Johnson swooped in and bought the land from Ramirez at more than double the cost at $6.85 million. Mick Giuseppe claims that not only were locals shocked by how much someone paid for the property, but allegations about a kickback scheme between Ramirez and Johnson floated around. Yet Johnson still didn't learn his lesson from El Peñon and for the second time neglected to conduct water testing. Though GGC Recovery states that Johnson did contract an engineering firm, he also closed on the sale before actually receiving their report. Johnson and Coben were at odds by this point, but even Berwick was getting a little worried. Berwick and Johnson controlled the holding company IGG, but they also had ownership of the dollar vigilante together and were involved in a questionable Paraguayan passport program at the time. If things fell through, this could ruin his reputation. Whether it was because he was in too deep, made the mistake of trusting Johnson or something else entirely, Berwick stood behind the GGC project and began promoting the land. Berwick made an announcement to the Dollar Vigilante in May, 2013, that the real Galt's Gulch had been created. In it, he detailed his own journey, how he wanted to escape the Canadian Revenue Agency, the IRS of Canada in 2003, and eventually became what he called a perpetual tourist taxpayer. Chile, he said, is Galt's Gulch, exactly as he imagined it in Atlas Shrugged. And his team had developed several parcels of land. One excerpt from his announcement reads, We are very excited to announce that GGC will now have its very own organic working farm with over 50 fresh deep water wells, registered water rights of over 750 liters per second, private on-grid power, paved roads, rolling hills, majestic mountains, and miles of natural beauty. With this massive supply of fresh water, we are eagerly planning out numerous lakes ranging in size from fishing ponds up to large recreational lakes for organic fish farms, kayaking, boating, and more. As you may expect in a sales pitch, Berwick also told his TDV subscribers that this was only pre-sale prices and spots were limited, encouraging them to invest soon. Berwick knew that things were shady behind the scenes, but he advocated for GGC anyway. This was a lot of money on the line too. 
1.25 to five acre lots could cost anywhere between 48 to $145,000. And lots ranging from 15 to 25 acres were $400,000. Mr. Berwick also promised that those who paid 400,000 would recoup from GGC their full purchase price within three years. Only a month later, Berwick learned just how unstable GGC was. In June, 2013, Ken Johnson was texting Berwick, revealing that Berwick never actually had any stake in IGG, the holding company. If you recall, the holding company that just bought this land was supposed to be shared by Berwick and Johnson, split right down the middle, 50-50. Johnson boldly admitted to Berwick that he defrauded him and that Berwick had no authority over IGG's bank accounts. Here's a piece of that text conversation from June 10th, 2013. Johnson, if you meddle with landowners, shareholders, or others involved with GGC, which you have no legal right to do, you will need to leave. Berwick, all I need to do is say in public that GGC is a fraud and it will all be over. I have no info at this time that it is not a fraud. Johnson, you have been partying while I've worked my ass to save this project. Your ego isn't going to fuck things up here, Jeff, fuck off. You are calling me and GGC a fraud, eh? Fucking pathetic. Berwick, what is my share ownership of GGC? Johnson, you have as many shares in GGC as I have in TDV. Berwick, so you are saying zero. If so, that is fraud. Johnson, how is that fraud? Berwick, because I used to have 50% of the company with you. Did that change? If I don't see anything that shows I am a 45% partner of this venture, I will have to publicly disclose that I've been defrauded and warn anyone who listens to me that they should not deal with this entity. Johnson, you run around to people asking them questions that should be asked to me, then asking if I'm an asshole or whatever comes to mind. It's pathetic, man. He later adds, show me a document that says you were 50%. That was never the case. To which Berwick states, I will shut this down unless I see proof that I have ownership and that there are at least one more person in control of the funds. I propose a meeting ASAP because every hour that goes by, I am moving forward on things. You have told me that I am not a 50% original owner in GGC, which is what we have agreed upon. You are now telling me that I am currently a 0% owner. You have accepted millions illegally from Americans and some of them are angry and you have provided them nothing, fraud. We can potentially work this all out, but I need a long talk to see if there's any way to avoid these issues. And to reiterate, this is only a piece of the 10 page long conversation. If you want to read it in its entirety, that will be in my sources. But the reason why this piece of the conversation is so important is because it proves that Berwick, at least as of June 10th, 2013, knew he was being defrauded. And he knew that Johnson had cut him out of the ownership. Yet what the GGC recovery group finds so disheartening is that despite this conversation and potential illegal activity, Johnson managed to lie his way back into Berwick's good graces and assure him that everything would be resolved. GGC also alleges that Berwick paid Johnson $141,000 for his stake in IGG. And though Johnson took his money, he never signed the document. Unfortunately, Berwick continued to promote and sell GGC to his followers. One of the most outspoken GGC buyers is a woman by the name of Wendy McElroy, who claims that she and her husband purchased a 1.25 acre lot in July, 2013. Not long after she received an anonymous email telling her that GGC was a fraud as they lacked water rights. Wendy forwarded the email to Johnson and Berwick, who said that the email came from a disgruntled employee demanding hush money or else he'd warn buyers. After the man was allegedly paid off, GGC acquired more land and continued promoting their project as if it was a sure thing. On October 17th, they posted to YouTube claiming that their grand spring opening would happen on October 30th through November 4th. As it took place in Chile, this is during their spring season. The video features a catchy little song from singer songwriter Tatiana Moroz with the lyrics, Fall away in the valleys of Chile. There's a place you can go, build a villa or chateau. Spend lots of time with people who understand that you don't have to be a slave. Draw a line in the sand. About a week later, they posted another video introducing the world to their organic farm. They talk about the lemons they produce and show footage of the land, canals, and mention their plans for the land. On November 10th, 2013, after the spring celebration, they posted yet another video introducing members of the GGC team a master planner, environmental manager, handyman, and administrative coordinator, all discuss their professional and working backgrounds, giving the project an air of legitimacy. One site called Coindesk ran an article headlined, pay in Bitcoin for a plot in Chilean libertarian paradise around that time as well, discussing the freedom and organic farming GGC promised. But behind the scenes, things were starting to fall apart. 
And before we get into the eventual downfall of Gal's Gulch, let's take a moment to thank today's sponsors. If you're looking for ways to skip the trip to the post office and dodge all the hectic holiday shopping traffic, why not save time and money with Stamps.com? Stamps.com lets you compare rates, print labels, and access exclusive discounts on UPS and USPS services all year round. It just makes sense, especially if your business sends more mail and packages during the holidays. I know Knox Investa, the candle company, most certainly has been, and we've been using Stamps to ship our packages to you. Whether you're selling online or running an office or a side hustle, Stamps.com can save you so much time, money, and stress during the holidays. So save time and money this holiday season with stamps.com. Sign up and use promo code PRISM for a special offer that includes a four week trial, free postage, and a digital scale. No long-term commitments or contracts. Just go to stamps.com, click the microphone at the top of the page and enter code PRISM. Again, go to stamps.com and use promo code PRISM for a four week trial, free postage, and a digital scale. This episode is also sponsored by Felix Gray. Five years ago, Felix Gray realized that they needed to be the company that was going to create eyewear that would improve our relationship with our screen time. Since that time, Felix Gray has been on a mission to create a better relationship between us and technology. Felix Gray lenses filter 15% of the most important blue light. So whether you're heading back to the office, back to school, or back to whatever, you can count on Felix Gray. And they have prescription and non-prescription available as well too. So there's a lot of variety with what you can do with your phone. Frames. Make sure you're visiting them at felixgrayglasses.com slash prism. Again, they've got the full spectrum of whatever you might be looking for for eyeglasses for your daily life. Check them out at felixgrayglasses.com slash prism. That's F-E-L-I-X-G-R-A-Y glasses.com slash prism. Free shipping, free returns, free exchanges. felixgrayglasses.com slash prism. From November, 2013 to mid 2014, GGC Recovery's timeline notes more strange and questionable actions by Johnson. He fired his lawyers and they speculate it was because they felt a duty to represent GGC instead of Johnson personally and expressed a duty to respond to equity investor queries. Johnson also offered to buy a neighboring property despite being unable to make payments for Lepe and a new investor money continued to flow in. In April, 2014, Johnson met another fraudster, Mario Del Real. Johnson wasn't making his payments on the land. He wasn't paying investors, employers, or contractors, but he still negotiated to purchase 51% of a company called Rio Colorado Mining and Exploration Company SA. This was a private purchase unrelated to GGC for $8 million. According to McGilzeppi, at this point, Johnson had still invested absolutely nothing into these projects yet he was spending investor money like it was his own. When the 8 million came due and Johnson couldn't pay, he traded equity from GGC instead. Since Johnson needed a board of directors to approve this, he named Del Real family themselves as the board. Mario received a quarter of a million dollars and became the majority shareholder. His daughter, Pamela, became a managing partner, treasurer, and accountant, and his children were given 10% ownership of GGC each. Pamela's personal bank account became the corporate GGC bank account as well. The lengths that Johnson went to in a way are impressive. If he'd been so thorough in researching Chile's laws in terms of water rights and zoning, then perhaps this mess could have been avoided. However, investors like Wendy were starting to catch on that something wasn't quite right. She learned that GGC is an environmentally protected area. And in her words, it would take the political movement of heaven and earth to allow a community based on mall lots to be officially approved. Barring a miracle, GGC simply wasn't going to happen. August, 2014, she spoke out about her experience and wrote, "'I had the opportunity to ask a question of the salesman who showed my husband and me our property. I claimed it because I fell head over heels for the most beautiful tree I've ever seen. I felt an instant connection as though the two of us were old souls who had found each other. I could believe it, I could see it. Waking up each morning and having coffee under that tree, telling it about my plans for the day. Months later in a Skype conference, I asked then GGC alienated salesman, when you sold us the property, when you pointed out a photo from your phone and read Wendy's tree, did you know you could not legally sell us the lot you were offering? He said, that is correct. Coben also stepped forward around this time and accused Berwick as being just as guilty as Johnson. He is not a righteous victim, Coben stated. Just because Berwick was effectively scammed too, it didn't mean he was acceptable. To his credit, Berwick did apologize shortly afterwards, whereas Johnson has consistently deflected attention from himself. But all wasn't lost just yet. 
The founding fathers of GGC, those wealthy first round investors, attempted to purchase the rights to GGC and reboot it. Wendy stated that she supported them as the idea of GGC was still appealing for those that purchased the land in the first place. October 24th, 2014, investor Tom Baker and advisor E.J. Lashley traveled to GGC Farms to ask him to leave the premises and turn the project over to an investor group. But according to Pan Am Post, Johnson sent a lackey, Ian Thornton, to assault them. Thornton's attack wasn't effective. There were no injuries and Johnson was apparently hiding in the bushes the entire time this happened. Eventually he gave up and abandoned the property to the investors. The same month, the GGC recovery team's lawyers found an error in the deed for the Lepe purchase. The Del Riel attempted to extort them on numerous occasions. The recovery team ignored him and instead a civil case was brought toward to declare Lepe purchase null and void. A former general manager of IGG also sued Johnson for repayment of a $400,000 loan and the Del Riel family reclaimed IGG to disassociate it from the GGC project. Though it's actually possible that GGC could have had a fresh start after this, Johnson returned in April, 2015 with four guys with guns and they terrorized the employees and took back the farm. After that, judging from GGC Facebook posts, Johnson seemed to run the farm with the help of traveling volunteers. Berwick, perhaps realizing the project was lost, revealed everything to his followers. He told them that one of the investors is now living in a car with his family and Johnson, the one person who put $0 into the project is hunkered down with weapons and living on the property that others bought. If Johnson was found to have violated the Urbanism and Construction Act, it may mean a felony conviction and with that deportation back to the United States. Ken Johnson, Mario Del Riel, his daughter Pamela, and Guillermo Ramirez were all charged with different crimes in regards to the entire GGC team. In addition to the larger crimes, Berwick has also accused Johnson of keeping indentured servants. Two 23-year-olds living in squalor, unpaid, without transportation, were allegedly found by the GGC recovery team. Johnson also allegedly dug illegal wells, cut down environmentally protected trees, gambled with GGC money, and fed salmon to his dog, while letting puppies abandon on the farm starved to death and leaving employees unpaid. This, according to Berwick, is only a small list of what Johnson has done. Chileans have been harmed too, not just investors. Wendy claims that the GGC owes hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars to hardware stores and service providers in the nearest town. According to Johnson, everyone else was the liar and there's only two or three invoices that have not been paid. Johnson alleges that Berwick has a drinking problem and knew all along that they weren't 50-50 partners. It's been a long repetitive history of Jeff Berwick making a lot of threats against me and being very defamatory towards me, he told Vice. In May, 2016, the courts in Chile saw the situation very differently and awarded one investor a refund plus penalties and legal fees, totaling over $1 million. Berwick claims he isn't associated with the GGC recovery program, distancing himself from the failed project. In 2015, he turned his attention towards an anarchopocal festival, a celebration of cryptocurrency, alternative wealth, and post-government politics. He advocated for like-minded people to move to Acapulco, Mexico, and create another stateless community, though the violence in the area has pushed many to leave. Although Gout's Gulch hasn't updated their information since mid 2020, it doesn't seem like this case is moving much further or that it's likely to move at all. Critics have said that GGC sounds exactly like the type of plan you'd expect from the author of Virtue of Selfishness. Another states that while you might expect libertarians to take personal responsibility, no one in this project seemed willing to do so. It was all pointing fingers at one another from investors to developers alike. All in all, over $10 million were taken away from 73 families. As for the founders, the last and most horrifying update is actually from Coben. He seemed like the least involved within the project or at least its mishaps. Coben is one of the worst of the bunch. Back in November, 2019, he drove through a crowd in Chile protesting income equality and the high cost of living. He also open fired into a crowd in the town of Renaca, seriously injuring at least one person. When arrested, Coben had the nerve to say, quote, I did not do anything wrong. It was a very dangerous, very scary time for me. Thankfully, I had my gun to be able to defend myself, end quote. I would love to hear the logic on how he can defend speeding his pickup truck through a crowd of people with that reasoning, but that's really all we've got to go off of. Coben has spoken out about violent action in the past before as well, when he talked about eliminating the communist plague and to not shoot at their legs, but straight in the heart so no witnesses are left. 
As for that day in Renaka, about 2000 people were protesting on a main road, asking drivers to dance with them in solidarity. Coben, who was on his way to a gun range, refused and attempted to speed through the crowd instead. The mob of people were banging against his truck and so Coben loaded his weapon and began firing. Though Coben says he was in fear of his life, the Washington Post reports that videos of the incident show a largely isolated vehicle and that when a barefoot protester threw an object towards Coben, he responded with more shots in the direction of the demonstrators, hitting one man in the thigh. In October, 2020, Coben was convicted of three counts, including attempted murder and unjustified shooting on a public way and sentenced to 11 years in prison. Ultimately, this story leaves us with an absolute mess of an ending and millions of dollars in losses and not much justice. It doesn't seem like the world is quite ready for a true Gauts Gulch right now. And ironically, without some form of regulation, one may never be possible. But with all of that being said, that's where today's episode will be coming to a close. I hope you learned something new from this episode today. And if you did, make sure you're liking, following, and subscribing so that you can stay up to date on all the latest episodes. If you wanna connect with me outside of these episodes, make sure to go to my description box. You're gonna find my Linktree link. It's got all of my links, social media, projects I'm involved in, anything you need to find me or any other projects that I'm working on, it will all be there. I wanna thank you for spending some time here with me today and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.